Do you want to stay more focused on the right goals in your life or even just figure out what the right goals are for you? Do you want clarity? Do you want better work-life balance? Well, you're in the right place. Welcome to Success Through Failure. Welcome to the Success Through Failure podcast, the show that reveals failure as your path to success. You'll listen to intriguing interviews with some of the most successful people on the planet and learn how their failures became a launchpad for success and how yours can too. Here's your host, former Division I All-American wrestler, former Division I head coach, speaker, and personal coach, Jim Harshaw. Welcome to another episode of Success Through Failure. Today, I bring you Charlie Engel. When I was a Division I All-American athlete, I was hyper-focused and I was able to take consistent action that allowed me to be one of the best in the country at what I did. Well, for years after I was done competing, I just struggled to stay focused on my goals day in and day out. I was easily distracted, so I wasn't able to stay consistent, the kind of consistency that you need to have to achieve goals that are meaningful to you. It was discouraging for me. I felt like I was just slipping kind of into mediocrity. Then after interviewing some of the highest performers in the world, Olympians, CEOs, billionaires, best-selling authors, I discovered how they do it. I discovered 18 powerful and sometimes weird tactics that they use to stay focused at work, focused on the right things while also living a balanced life. And if you start using probably just three of these today, you're going to get more done in the next eight hours. I promise. This is not tomorrow, not next week. These will work today. I guarantee it. It's like magic, but they're real world solutions to it. People like you and me want the ability to stay focused, avoid distraction, and be consistent. I use at least four of them every day and have used all of them at some point. And now I'm able to stay focused while I'm at work and get probably 50 to 100% more done each day. I'm more present when I'm home with my wife and four kids. And the result is I have a stronger relationship with my family and I'm still able to achieve incredible goals like being selected to give a TEDx talk at one of the biggest TED events in the world, like launching a podcast and talking to A-list guests and running a half marathon, all of this while having a full-time job that includes frequent travel, working nights and weekends and all that good stuff. So you're going to find solutions on this list that are going to surprise you. Grab your copy of the 18 Tactics to Staying Focused at Work. Just go to jimharshawjr.com slash focus. That's jimharshawjr.com slash focus. Charlie is an ultra marathoner, a adventure seeker, a global explorer, and a philanthropist. Uh, he's also a recovering crack addict, a convicted felon, and a man driven to the edge of human endurance and achievement. After a decade-long addiction to crack cocaine and alcohol, Charlie hit bottom with a near-fatal six-day binge that ended in a hail of bullets. As Engel got sober, he began turning to running, which became his lifeline, his pastime, and his salvation. The Matt Damon-produced documentary, Running the Sahara, followed Engel as he and his team went on a harrowing, record-breaking 4,500-mile run across the Sahara Desert, which helped raise millions of dollars for charity. His growing notoriety led to an investigation and subsequent unjust conviction for mortgage fraud, for which he spent 16 months in federal prison in Beckley, West Virginia. In his book, Running Man, Charlie tells the surprising, funny, and emotional story of his life, detailing his setbacks and struggles and how he blazed a path to freedom by putting one foot in front of another. In his most recent latest adventure upcoming here, Charlie seeks to become the first person in history to trek from the lowest point to the highest summit on every continent. From the lowest point of the planet, the depths of the Dead Sea, Charlie will swim, free dive, run, paddle, mountain bike, and climb his way through multiple countries and landscapes, striving to complete his journey on the very tip of the earth, Mount Everest. And as usual for the listeners, if you don't have time to listen to this entire episode, or if you hear something you like, but you don't have a chance to write it down, make sure you grab your free copy of the action plan. Just go to jimharshawjr.com slash action. Charlie, welcome to the show. Jim, thank you, man. That was, that was fantastic. It didn't sound boring. I appreciate the uh, full disclosure there and, and thanks for that great intro. Well, geez, 
I've done a lot of research on you, Charlie, and, and there's nothing boring about anything that I came across in all of my research. So uh, this should be fun. So let's just start with you telling us a little bit about your background, kind of where you grew up, and uh, and so let's start from there. Yeah, thanks, man. So, uh, you know, I'm a North Carolinian by birth and pretty much grew up around here. I live in, in Durham, North Carolina these days, but I but I have lived all over the all over the world at this point. But my parents were super young college students at UNT Chapel Hill, and my old man actually played basketball for Dean Smith in, wow. for a couple of years in his first years of coaching at Carolina. And my mother was, you know, 19-year-old drama major, and they uh, and they got pregnant, and there I was. <laughs> and, you know, that marriage didn't actually last very long, but I stayed with my mom in North Carolina and kind of, uh, you know, grew up in the Durham area for the most part. And you know, she was a perpetual college student, so we moved to Athens and Georgia for a while and, and, you know, kind of bounced around, but always ended up back in North Carolina. And ultimately, I went to high school here and went to UNC Chapel Hill, where in 1980, when I went to college, <laughs> the drinking age was still uh, 18 years old. And uh, I, I like to say that I, I went to college with an incredible uh, high school resume student body president and team captain and good grades. And I got to college and found out I was incredibly average. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> those great everybody... institutions like that will do that to you. Yeah. Well, UVA, Carolina, right. you know, all these schools, you know, you go there and you, you think you're special because you were in high school and, you know, and you get there and you find out there's a whole lot of other really smart, accomplished people. And for me, people who were just better at things than I was. But what I figured out really quickly uh, through the college experience was that I was a better drinker than anyone else that I knew. And consequently, I, I sort of made that my vocation in college. And look, a lot of people drink and party in college, but, you know, my friends, you know, might have stayed up till two o'clock in the morning drinking and they, but they got up for their eight o'clock class and they took the test and they, they did college and, and I didn't, I couldn't. And, you know, by my third year of college, I was done. And, um, you know, and in short, I, I don't dwell on this part of my story, but I, but I spent the next 10 years really just bouncing around the country. And I was a drug, you know, I, I, I discovered cocaine in college and couldn't kick it. I couldn't ditch it. And everywhere I went, of course, it was there. And, you know, I spent a lot of years basically bouncing around the country and working good jobs. And I'd be the top salesman and I'd overachieve. And, and then I would get comfortable and start drinking and doing drugs and have the inevitable dive into the abyss and I would, I would be asked to, uh, you know, leave the premises and I'd move to another state and do it all over again. And, you know, and I spent 10 years doing that exact thing and it, you know, it almost killed me. I was, I was lucky to survive it. So you were high functioning and you were performing and you found success even, even in the midst of this decade long sort of plunge into drugs and alcohol. But it, it all almost came crashing down. Uh, I guess it did come crashing down. Can you talk about this, it, the, the hail of bullets and kind of th this whole sort of where it came to a, a crescendo for you? Totally. And, and, you know, it's interesting. Like I was in my mid-20s, I worked, uh, I sold Toyotas, right? So I'm a car salesman, which it's, it's, a, it's almost a cliche, a, a drug addict drinking car salesman. <laughs> but but I was the number one salesman in the country for Toyota for a couple of years. Wow. I sold a lot of cars. And, you know, so for me, my mission in a way was to make sure that on my own personal, you know, balance sheet, that if I could be the top salesman, if I could be this overachiever on one side, then nobody would question my really bad behavior on the other side of the balance sheet. And, I always said that, you know, the, the boss isn't going to fire the top salesman. And that absolutely turned out not to be true, by the way. And, you know, and I would, people would get tired of my nonsense. You know, they would, the benefit of having me on the team would ultimately be, you know, outweighed by the chaos that I created around me. And so that led me to a point in my life where I was married, I was 29 years old, and my first son Brett was born. And, you know, look, I had been trying to quit for years, quit drugs, quit alcohol, 
I had done everything you can think of, you know, to control it. Only drink on weekends, only drink after five, only drink beer, only do this, only do that. And normal people don't have to control their drinking, but it took a long time for me to understand that. And so I thought Brett was going to change that, that my son would just simply by his very birth, because I knew I didn't want to raise a child in an addictive environment. And I thought he would just change it just by being born. And for for a couple of months, he did. And, you know, I, I looked at this little boy and I felt love and feelings for him and from him that I didn't know existed. Because as an addict, I just like I just assumed I was broken, like that I wasn't entitled somehow to have those feelings. And I certainly wasn't entitled to love. And and so once I got that, I like I, I had hope for the first time in my life that I was finally going to get past this addiction. And two months later, I found myself in the worst part of the neighborhood for no explicable reason. Like, I, I don't know what the catalyst was, but there I was. And, you know, for six days, I was there, you know, killing myself. And that ended with the police searching my car and me sitting on the ground watching this scene like out of a movie. And, you know, there's bullet holes in my car that were put there by someone who was trying to shoot me. Like they weren't shooting in my car, they were shooting at me. And, you know, I remember the policeman kind of uh, reaching under the driver's seat of the car and pulling out a glass pipe and, and like looking at me, you know, in this condemning way. And, you know, any sane, rational person would have been thinking, I'm in some serious trouble now, you know, and all I could think was like, so that's where that was, you know, yeah. and, you know, it was that kind of sick thinking that had kept me in that place. And, you know, I, I had the clearest thought I'd ever had in that moment, Jim, and, and it was this, that, you know, Brett can't save you, like nobody's coming to save you. And you have to decide if you're going to save yourself or not. And, you know, I chose between living and dying. And, and, and I, what I actually ended up choosing was running. So, you know, I chose a different path altogether. How, how did that come about? I mean, you go from the lowest of lows where you're almost dead to, you know, obviously where you're at now. There's a lot in between there. But... But why running? And and take us from that moment from, you know, the police find you, you got holes in your car, you got a glass pipe, you're you're on a binge, and where did the healing start? Yeah, and I mean it it is interesting how just the commitment, just saying the words out loud to myself that I don't want to do this anymore. Cause I had quit like so many people. I had quit for other people a hundred times, you know, for my wife, for my son, for my job, for my whatever, you pick the reason, but never for myself. And I've been a runner, a good athlete in high school. And even during my years of addiction, you know, I would occasionally clean up for a month or two and running was always a part of sort of reclaiming my life during those times. And, and so I knew that running had value for me, but I didn't understand yet what kind of value. And that day, sitting on the ground watching the police, you know, I went to a meeting, a recovery meeting that very night. And then I got up the next morning and I ran just a couple of miles. And I'm sure it was awful. And I did those two things, though, for the next three years without missing a single day. I ran and I went to a meeting every single day. And you know, and slowly I began to build a life for myself and I, I reclaimed, well, I can't even say I reclaimed, I claimed a life that I never had and um, running. I needed both things. I couldn't just go to like 12 step meetings and sit in there and listen to people. I also needed the physical release running and sweating to like clean out all the crap from my head and my heart and once I was able to actually, you know, do that and understand how important it was for me from that point forward, you know, one day at a time, I actually managed to stay sober. And uh, this concept that nobody's coming to save you, you have to make the decision. You said you just made a commitment, right? And I find that to be 
the hardest part. I find making the commitment to something the hardest part. And after that, it's maybe not easy, but it's easier, right? The the emotion is taken out of it, right? Because you make a commitment and and now, you know, when you're presented with a challenge, it's it's again not easy, but easier to say, No, I've made the commitment, right? And you said you made the commitment for lots of different reasons, but you finally made the commitment for the right reason for yourself, right? Yeah, and you know, you said it so well right there, Jim, because I mean it really is you know, the commitment is towards the effort and people get way me included, get way too caught up in the result. And early on in any process, I don't care if it's starting a business, starting a family, or getting sober, we get so tied up with the projections of what we want the results to be or what we want the journey to be like along the way that we forget that this personal exploration that we go on in all those instances, again, whether it's starting a business, a family, or getting sober, you know, it's a journey. It is a journey of exploration. And the word exploration means that we don't already know the answers. <laughs> and so the only thing you're capable of truly committing to wholeheartedly is the effort, is the commitment to yeah. start. And so for the first time ever, I committed to honestly start this process in a way that I acknowledge that I didn't have all the answers. I didn't know what was going to happen the next day. I only knew that today I was going to go for a run and I was going to go to a meeting and that the rest of my day would kind of be up in the air and I would make the best of it. And in that slow you know, way that life rolls forward, you know, I, I slowly began to get on top of all of these behaviors that I had had for so long, these self-defeating behaviors. And I stopped worrying about what was going to happen tomorrow or next week. And I focused entirely on the moment I was living. And lo and behold, things kind of just took care of themselves. And I challenge the listener to think about the process that that you know that you have to commit to, right? You know there's a process that you have to commit to. And are you over-focused on the outcome? And I've said this a lot of times on the podcast over the years is, you know, you've got to focus on the process, not the outcome. Because Charlie, you you didn't know when you went for, this sounds ridiculous to say, but you obviously didn't know that you went for the, when you went for the two mile run the next morning, you didn't know that that was going to turn into a 4,500 mile trek across the Sahara. (laughs) And if I had, (laughs) if I had thought that way, I would have, you know, I would have run the other way, so to speak, or I would have, You know, I mean, the daunting nature of the things we all take on, and and I think the most daunting might be having children. If any of us truly (laughs) understood the responsibility and the chaos and uh, just all of that when we when we signed on for this, I'm not sure we would ever do it. But (laughs) but, you know, we watch other people and we see, you know, that's the beauty of 12 step recovery, too, and of running and of business. If you're a person who thinks you have all the answers, then good luck to you. You're, I don't, you know, I use mentors. I am a big believer, Jim, in this concept of attraction rather than promotion. In other words, I like to watch people and see what their behavior is. And, and I treat myself this way, too. I never, like, talk about I never would go up to somebody and say, hey, man, you look like you're drinking too much. You should think about getting sober. Like, that's not my business. But what I can do is I can be sober around that person. And maybe they're they're always watching, right? And maybe someone will see me and see the life that I've built and they know that what I used to be like. And, and they'll come to the conclusion that some of the things that I have and the way I'm living is better than the way they are. And then maybe they come to me and they ask the question, you know, how do I change my life? Then I have the permission to like tell them, look, I don't know how you're going to do it, but here's how I did it. And I think that we all get a little too caught up sometimes in even like you and I are both sort of, you know, life coaches to a certain degree, but it's some of that's formal, some of it's informal. Because the best coaching and the best mentoring that any of us ever do is just by living our truth, yeah. by doing what it is that we say we stand for and allowing other people to observe that to make their decision 
about what they want to do with their own life. And for, for the listener, I just want to point out success leaves clues. So far, Charlie's talked about focus on the process, not the outcome. He's talked about getting mentors. He's talked about making commitments. I mean, these are these are fundamentals, right? Fall in love with the fundamentals. You've got to go back to these things. Success leaves clues. And so, Charlie, you went from two miles to this this extraordinary four thousand five hundred mile trek. <laughs> There's there's a there's a gap in there somewhere, right? And and by the way, I want to point out that probably that next morning, had you said, you know what, I'm, I want to, you know, or somebody presented you with an idea of like, hey, how about a four thousand five hundred mile trek across the Sahara? You probably would have said no. And if you, even if you did say, yeah, that sounds like a good idea, let's set that goal, you probably wouldn't have gotten there, right? Because you would have taken your eye off the process and started focusing on the outcome, but but you stayed focused on the process. So what was that process that led from the two mile run and then the daily running and the daily meetings to, you know, some of these incremental benchmarks that you hit before you did the, 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 the massive journey across this era. Man, you got me smiling, man. I'm sitting here just with a big smile on my face. <laughs> Cause it's so, it's so, I understand how absurd it sounds, you know, to think it that somehow does. running across this era is a good idea. And, <laughs> and look, I think the knee jerk reaction that a lot of people have is, Oh, well, this guy's just, you know, an extremist and he just swapped one addiction for another. And, and I had to kind of come to terms with that early on because I heard people say that and, and I sort of listened to it. I was like, yeah, maybe that is all I've done, but just a little aside, you know, the fact that about addiction and everyone listening to this is falls into a couple of categories. You either are an addict, you have a family member, a son, a father, a whatever, a friend, uh, a person yep. who has struggled with addiction. Yep. Because no, no person who ever leaves their house isn't affected somehow by an addict or by addiction in their life. So right. everyone has some experience. And, you know, on the surface, it may have looked like my running was obsessive and whatever, but addiction is about having no feelings. Addiction is about being invisible. And if, if you want to hide, then that's what addiction is for. Running is the exact opposite. Mm. If you, you know, if you run a hundred or you run a marathon, I don't care. You just go out for your, your run around the block. If it's hard for you, you understand the concept that there's no hiding. Like you, you have to feel what's going on. Yeah. It's almost the opposite. It is. Yeah, exactly. It illuminates everything. In fact, and so if you take that lesson and the lesson of even going for a three mile run and feeling the discomfort of that three mile run and the sweating and maybe the desire to quit even, but you find a way to push past that moment where you want to quit and just go a little farther or get to the end of the run, that satisfaction and peace that you feel at the end of that. I, that's what I became, you know, addicted to, I guess, like that, that is where I wanted to be all the time. And so the point being that I, I learned very quickly that the greatest and hardest lessons I had ever, and most useful lessons I had ever learned had come through addiction and recovery. They had come through running. And I understood that I could purposely put myself in an uncomfortable position through athletic achievement, whether it's running or obstacle racing or cycling or whatever it might be, I could make myself uncomfortable. And I was guaranteed a lesson. And like, you don't get that from things that are comfortable. Like there's nothing, you can take a vacation to Aruba and sit on a beach for a week. And it doesn't mean you don't deserve it or anything, but there's, there's probably no lesson. Yeah. There's no growth happening. At the end of the week. Right. But you could, you could go take a bike tour through France and kind of work your tail off every day and enjoy the fruits of that work every night. And like, you'd come away with so many lessons and so much insight into who you are and how you behave. So we, we pushed that forward and I started to say, okay, and look, I freely admit this is addictive language. Like, if a little bit of this is getting me this result, then a lot of this is going to get me this result. Sure, That's not necessarily true with running, but, but what it did spark in me was this desire to see just how far I could go. 
I mean, it's really that simple. Which is like not the which to, is not addiction, right? The addiction is not that, right? No, it's not a desire no, to see how far your, you can go. And look at your business, Jim. I mean, whatever your business is, right? If you have some success and you have a good year, guess what? You want to have a better year the next year. And yeah. you you know, there is a balance. There is a, a point where I realize the effort may not equal, you know, the lessons or the outcome, but that's part of life. You figure that out as you go and then you make adjustments. So for me, I started running 50 miles and I started running a hundred miles and I started running hundreds of miles across jungles and deserts and mountain ranges around the world. And, and the lessons that I got and the relationships that I built out of those shared suffering experiences. And I, and I say those words slowly because they, again, in business or even in your own family, you know, you it's life is about shared suffering. As far as I'm concerned, you know, yeah. But suffering isn't a bad word. It's just that, you know, we all sort of fight our way through our daily lives. And that fight is rewarding and hard and sometimes makes us want to quit. And I took those things and applied them to running. And they led me opportunistically to the Sahara Desert, which is strange. But someone just in passing said to me, hey, have you ever thought about running across the Sahara Desert? And like this person was a stranger to me at the time. And and. I always say that words that are like said to us by by a complete stranger can change the course of our entire lives yeah. if we're if we're paying attention. And I couldn't stop thinking about it. I, I, I first thought that's a stupid idea. Who would want to do that? Like <laughs> what what would there be in running across this area? But I, I couldn't let it go and I turned out it turned out that no one else had ever done it before and firsts in the adventure world are super hard to come by. Yeah. And I just I just decided to start telling people I was going to be the first person to run across the Sahara. And uh, I was working as a producer for the TV show, Extreme Makeover Home Edition at the time. Yeah. And a guy who worked on the show, just a buddy of mine, I think he got tired of hearing me talk about this. And he's like, hey, I'll introduce you to this guy, James Mall. He's a, a Academy Award winning director. If you'll just shut up and start, you know, stop talking about it. <laughs> and I got this meeting and James Mall stood up at the end of the worst pitch in history and stuck out his hand and said he would do it. Wow. And a week later, a week later, he calls me and he's like, Hey, I just told Matt Damon about this idea and he loves it so much. You know, he wants to narrate the film and he wants to executive produce the project. You know, would that be okay with you? And I'm, I'm like, Shit, I, I was really hoping for somebody better, but sure, Matt Damon would be just <laughs> Sure, fine. he's okay. And, you know, and so now all of a sudden I've got these two Academy Award winners attached to a project about, you know, running across sand. It's like, what is this going to be about? And, you know, and, and ultimately a year later, I'm there on the coast of Senegal and West Africa, and I'm surrounded by a team, including two other runners who are trusting me. Uh, and there's probably 15 of us there. And, everybody's excited and ready to go and fired up. And I'm all I could think is I, I've suckered these people into the Sahara desert <laughs> and we're all going to die. Oh, like, wow. you know, and we, you know, but there we are. And, and, and we are on the doorstep of, of West Africa and getting ready to make our way all the way across the desert to the Red Sea and Egypt. And uh, it, it turned out to be, you know, the hardest physical journey of my life. I can only begin to imagine that journey you know it, so it didn't all just go uh, as planned you just started running and everything was perfect and uh, logistically it was easy and then uh, you ended up on the other <laughs> side of the continent right didn't didn't go quite go like that <laughs> exactly perfect yeah there's nothing to tell sure no and i mean you know your your point is so well taken you know i mean what i knew was success was going to be all about our ability to adapt to the changing circumstances. And, and of course, that's the same as the rest of our lives. But, you know, only a week into this expedition, we had fallen apart. Like, it was 140 degree ground temperature Oof. every day. It was, we had been lost in sandstorms and we ran out of food and water and two of my support people quit. Wow. And like my two fellow runners were both on IVs my because they were so dehydrated. Like, it was going to be the shortest long expedition in history. And on day eight, Jim, I basically just had a, a talk with myself as we do. And I, and I understood 
that I had been approaching this project completely wrong. I had been looking, I've been so focused on the finish line and on getting done with this thing that I had forgotten that it is the, you know, the one day at a time journey that matters. And so on day nine, I woke up and all I thought about that day was running a marathon before lunch. And I took a break at lunch, got up, and all I thought about for the afternoon was running a second marathon. And I got to the end of the day and put my little foam mat down on the ground and looked up at a billion stars and, and just gave thanks for the opportunity to be out there suffering and struggling and just being alive. And slowly but surely, in that one day at a time way, we made our way across the Sahara Desert and ultimately covered nearly 5,000 miles, running almost 50 miles per day for 111 consecutive days without taking wow. a single day off. Unbelievable. And, and it was. It was incredible. And, and look, you'll be interested. You know, the physical journey was incredible. And we learned unbelievable number of lef- lessons. But the, you know, the real benefit, the real legacy, if you will, was, you know, Matt Damon and I created something called H2O Africa. And today that nonprofit is known as Water.org. And, you know, Water.org is the world's largest clean water nonprofit. Yeah. And it was born out of this ridiculous crazy idea that somehow running across the Sahara Desert was a good idea. <laughs> and I remind people all the time that you don't know, you know, you, your heart needs to be in the right place. All I wanted to know was, was I good enough to run all the way across the Sahara? And I'm no genius or philanthropist and good things came out of it that I never could have thought about even. And, and that's the beauty of it. If you just, like we've already said, you can only control your effort. You can't control the outcome. But if you right. if you step to the start line, good things will happen. Yeah. So for the listener, I want to give you some perspective on this because you're saying, I- I'm not running across the Sahara. Uh, I don't have this grand adventure that I'm trying to complete, this grand vision, and Matt Damon's not behind me, like cheering me on and behind me, behind this, this project that I call my life. It's just, I'm just, I'm trying to heal my marriage, Jim, or I'm trying to lose 30 pounds, or I'm trying to get the promotion or start the business or, or whatever it is, get out of your rut, right? Like, but it's the same for you. It's the same process, right? You're trying to get to the next level, the next thing. It's day by day. And I really want to emphasize what Charlie said, because this is another fundamental lesson. He said, I was just grateful every day. I lay down under the stars, under a billion stars. I can't imagine what that view looked like, by the way. But man, under the stars and just said, I'm grateful for the day. I'm grateful for for the suffering and the growth that just happened. Now on to tomorrow, right? And and that's where you have to be because life is a journey, right? We I know yeah, we all want to get somewhere, right? There and whenever you get there, there's gonna be another there there, right? So you've got to be satisfied and happy and okay with today and the ups, the downs, and the suffering that happens today. Because that's that's what life is, right? And and we go through the good days and the bad days, but but there's always going to be challenges, there's always going to be setbacks, there's always going to be adversity, there's always going to be hurdles, there's always going to be pain, but you've got to find the things to be grateful for and you've got to do just like Charlie talked about, put one foot in front of the other and you will get there. You will keep moving towards that place where you want to move towards and and you got to be happy here and happy on the path getting there. Man, that was beautiful. You got me fired up. I'm standing up cheering right now. So <laughs> it was, it was yeah. really well said. And, and it's, you can only run today's miles today. I can't, I can't run tomorrow's miles until I get there. And I think that that lesson holds true for everything you just said. And I mean, your story just is, is such a perfect microcosm for an, an analogy full of analogies for life. So Charlie, can you tell us, let's, let's just focus on this, on this this journey, uh, gosh, any part of your journey, right? Whether it's the Sahara or your life. Uh, tell me about a time where you failed, right? A time where you failed and as a result, you just felt that hopelessness and that overwhelming self-doubt that, that you didn't know if you could keep going or get to that next level. And you you gave us one example, right? When when you went on the, on the binge and the police found you. I mean, is there another example since you've recovered where you failed, right? And, and you felt some doubt, but you still had to push through? 
Totally. And I'll give you two examples and I'll, I'll keep them brief. But after the Sahara a year or so, I decided I was going to try to run across the U.S. and break the record for the fastest crossing. And it was a really aggressive record. Uh, I needed to run over 70 miles per day for 45 consecutive days. And I partnered with United Way and all these special needs schools across the country. And I was going to run every day and stop and talk to kids and do these amazing, you know, this was my plan, which was not a bad plan, except for the one thing that I overlooked. It was going to be incredibly hard. (laughs) (laughs) And, and the, you know, the chance of failure was high. And by day 17, my body had fallen apart. I had MRSA, like this terrible staph infection, and I could no longer continue. And I, I don't do things quietly. So the running world, at least my running world was watching and I failed in front of all of them. I, I had big sponsors on board. I had, you know, all of this. And so in the running part of this, I failed and I felt like a failure and I was shooting another film and, and an amazing thing happened. And it's that During those 17 days of running 70 plus miles per day, I didn't even have a minute to think, much less visit a school or anything else. Once I stopped running, I actually, I I got on a bike and I finished the rest of the crossing of the United States because I had a friend who was also running and I supported him. But what I did get to do was all of a sudden I'm stopping at schools and I've got gymnasiums of special needs children that they're there listening and guess what they didn't care whether i was running across the country or yeah, not yeah what they what they cared is that i had shown up to talk to them and to spend a, an hour you know pushing kids in wheelchairs around the track or hanging out and just laughing and having a good time and so you know once again as i love to say you know the universe did for me what i couldn't do for myself And so that failure, that really humiliating failure on the athletic side led to an unbelievable experience on the other side. And look, the other one you alluded to at the beginning, and, you know, I don't want to, we don't need to dwell on this story, but I became, after this air, a professional speaker, and I got sponsorships, and I was on Jay Leno and all the morning news shows, and I also attracted the attention of a single IRS agent who who wanted to know, you know, how I paid my taxes. And his investigation actually showed, you know, that I absolutely paid my taxes. But to just flash forward, because the details aren't all that important, I ultimately became the only person in the United States, the only borrower charged with overstating my income on a home loan application from 2005. And and for that, I could spend 20 years in federal prison. Wow. And, you know, and I fought these charges, you know, it was a terrible thing. I lost everything overnight, all the sponsors, all the speaking gigs, all the accolades, like everything disappeared in one day. Forget about being convicted, you know, just being charged in this day and age means everything's gone. Yeah, I was, you know, I was basically, you know, booted off the board of the two nonprofits that I had started. And and ultimately, I fight this. I'm through a technicality. I'm found not guilty of providing false information, but guilty of mail fraud because I put a closing package in the mail that enclosed that included some false information. And whether I knew it was there or not didn't matter. Point of all that is I get sentenced to 21 months in federal prison in Beckley, West Virginia. And I, so here I am 19 years clean and sober. I've conquered all these demons. I've run across the Sahara. I've done all this stuff. And on Valentine's day, 2011, my teenage sons are driving me to prison to drop me off at in Beckley, West Virginia to start a 21 month sentence in federal prison. And I had to figure, dude, I was scared. And I was mostly, I was angry though. I I, I felt like, I I was mad at what had been done to me and it took me only a few days to figure out that if I kept that angry attitude, I was not going to make it that like fair or unfair no longer mattered. This was the situation I was in prison and I had to figure out who I was going to be in that place. 
And I turned to running again and I ran outside every single chance I had. And when I, we were on lockdown or I couldn't leave my cell, I ran in place and I did it sometimes for six or eight hours at a time. Wow. And I mean, people thought I was nuts, which in federal prison actually isn't a bad thing. Nobody bothered the crazy dude running in his cell. And here's the thing I want to say, though, the point that I think you'll like. Just as we were talking about earlier, in the in this idea of attraction rather than promotion, people thought I was nuts, but guess what? Slowly but surely, guys started to come up to me and say, hey, you know, can you teach me how to run? Because I'd like to lose weight, feel better, whatever. They just saw the way I was handling my time in there, and they said to themselves, I assume, that, you know, hey, I would like to have some of that feeling for myself. So when I got to Beckley, there were maybe three people running regularly around the track. And by the time I left that place a year and a half later, there were 50 guys in my running group running wow. every single day, no every way. day. And I had 25 guys doing yoga on the softball field three days a week. Wow. And it's this attraction rather than promotion. If you just do your thing and you're honest about it and you're passionate about it, the right people will be attracted to that and, and you will build your tribe, your posse. And, you know, I left there. I would never choose that as a path. <laughs> of course, nobody would choose prison, but I left there with so much more perspective. And, you know, and there were people in there, man, who had 25 year sentences for drug convictions that were similar to what I was doing when I was 25 years old, but I yeah. just never got caught. Yeah. You know, and so who am I going to complain to for my my time there? And, you know, and I, I left and these guys thanked me for what I had done for them. And, and what they didn't get is they did so much more for me than I ever could have done for them just by allowing me the opportunity to help them. Man, Charlie, incredible story. I mean, it's a shame that I don't have you for two hours. You know, this could be a two-hour conversation easily. Holy mackerel. Um, for the listener, I, I want you to go get the book, check it out, check them out, learn more about them. But Charlie, tell us, just tell us about your next adventure, 5.8. Yeah, and I'll keep it brief because I literally leave. I don't, I'm not sure in the world of podcasting when this is going to air. This will be just a couple I of am, weeks from, from uh, the recording here today. Well, when, when this airs, I will be in Ethiopia and starting my next project. So when listeners are listening to this, they can think about me. I start from the coast of East Africa in Djibouti on August the 27th, and I will cross 2,000 miles across uh, Ethiopia, Kenya, into Tanzania to the top of Kilimanjaro. And I'm doing it, I call it 5.8, this project, because it's Basically, it's 5.8 miles from the lowest land elevation in the world to the highest. From the Dead Sea to the top of Mount Everest is only 5.8 vertical miles. So I'm not telling this story very well, but 5.8 is a series of seven expeditions where I will go from the lowest point to the highest point on all seven continents over the next two years. And it's this journey we're all on, right, Jim? We're we're all on a roller coaster of low places and high points, and this yeah. this battle metaphorically of always trying to fight our way back up to the peak. And you know you're not going to be there forever. And so if people want to follow, they can. The easiest thing to do is quite literally just go to my website, which is charlieengel.com. All my social media handles are right there. You can sign up to follow, and I'll send you blogs and videos and. I'm going to be documenting the heck out of this thing and, and hopefully telling some good stories along the way. Very cool. And for the listener, you got all the links right there. I'll have all the links to Charlie's website, social media, et cetera. In the action plan, go to jimharshawjr.com slash action. Charlie, as you take us out, can you tell us one action item that the listener should take in the next 24 to 48 hours to start moving toward their goals and to start following that process and setting that process for themselves? It's easy. This is the, it's the easiest question you asked me today. Stop waiting for the circumstances to be perfect to get started on that thing you've wanted to do. I don't care if it's starting a family, starting a business, or, or training for a marathon. I'll choose running since that's the easiest one. People always come up to me and they're like, so I want to run a marathon. How do I go about it? I'm like, do you own a computer? They're like, yeah. 
I'm like, find a race, pay your money and enter. Right. And there's so Make much power, power in the commitment to get started. And that will get you moving down the path to your goals. So stop trying to wait for the, what you consider the perfect scenario, because that day will never come. Start today and just get busy. Love it. What great advice to go out with. Charlie, thank you so much for making time to come on the show. It was really a pleasure. I enjoyed it thoroughly, and I look forward to doing it again someday. Likewise, good luck on your next grand adventure. We'll be following. All right, buddy. Take care. And for the listener, until next time, take the time to get clear on your goals and embrace failure as a stepping stone on your path to success. 